important to you, it's next on Action 11. Action 11 is brought to you in part by First National Bank. Nobody offers you higher rates or makes it easier to purchase six-month certificates than First National. It's just been a grand, grand thing for life. And so that way, any time it pleases him, take me out of the way of other people, well, I guess I'll be ready to go. Action 11, Kentuckiana's number one news broadcast with Jim Mitchell and Kirsty Wilde, Dave Conrad with sports, and Chuck Taylor with the weather. Good evening. Colonel Sanders didn't live to be 100 as he hoped, but his 90 years were filled with enough accomplishment for a couple of lifetimes. He died this morning at 740 in Jewish Hospital. His doctors said he died without pain. Last summer, doctors told the colonel that he had leukemia. Since then, he had been in and out of the hospital battling pneumonia and other complications, always fighting back with that feisty spirit. His story is an American classic success beyond dreams through imagination and determination. The man whose name and face mean Kentucky around the world was born across the Ohio River on a farm near Henryville, Indiana. He was cooking before the age of seven to help his widowed mother. I lived on a poor Indiana farm over here and mother sewed for the neighbors. Back 75 years ago, there wasn't many store-bought clothes, none for boys and girls going to school, so mom made the clothes for all the boys in the neighborhood and and I done the cooking for the family, see, so under her direction. He opened a service station on busy Highway 25 in Corbin, and in 1936, Sanders was named a Kentucky Colonel. The service station became a court and cafe, where he developed the quick cooking method and 11 herbs and spices that made his special chicken. In 1956, he was 65, business was thriving, but Interstate 75 was about to shift all the traffic off his highway. So he closed the cafe and went on the road with his wife to sell his chicken recipe. He called on a restaurant and want to demonstrate to him and his employees my method of frying chicken and the seasoning for it. As I tell him, I thought it would be better than what he was serving. Well, sometimes that was an insult to him. They didn't <laughs> like that idea. Cause... So uh, I've been thrown out of more good restaurants than any man in the United <laughs> States just for that. But finally, when that one would let me try it, he and his employees liked it. Then I would go to try to ask him, then let's, let's put it on the menu for a day and see how your customers like it. That's the one you got to pee. And I knew invariably they'd take it, see, because there's just nothing any better than the Kentucky Fried Chicken was in those days. Sanders would take a Nicholas serving from his first franchisee in Salt Lake City. The rest would go to the restaurant. And that's the way it worked for the 1,000 stores that eventually opened with the Colonel's trademark by 1964. That year, the business was too big for him. He was 74 and wanted to get out. So he sold to a Nashville tycoon and a Louisville lawyer. The lawyer was John Y. Brown, Jr. The price was $2 million. The colonel made his millions at an age when others retired. The headquarters moved from Shelbyville to Nashville. Sanders thought that was a travesty until Brown brought it back to Kentucky. I think we ought to sing hallelujah and go to shouting by Joe. <laughs> all felt like I do. Though he was a paid spokesman for Kentucky Fried Chicken, he spoke his mind. After John Brown merged the enterprise with the food giant Hubline, things got much worse in the eyes of the legendary colonel. I know some of the equipment they got that don't produce good chicken at all. It's edible. But my heavens, there's nothing like Kentucky Fried Chicken used to be. The face and the name are known worldwide. But Colonel Sanders didn't just appear in commercials around the world. He traveled hundreds of thousands of miles, meeting heads of state, stars, religious leaders. Doctors discovered that Sanders had leukemia several months ago. At first, he responded to chemotherapy and was well enough for a 90th birthday party in September. Happy birthday to you. In an interview this year, Colonel Sanders talked about the prospect of death. I hear I am at 89, I'm still able to work, and 
it's just been a grand, a grand thing for life. And so that way, any time it pleases him, take me out of the way of other people, well, I guess I'll be ready to go. As we told you, Colonel Sanders made his fortune when he sold the Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises. The man who bought KFC made millions of his own on that deal, and that was John Y. Brown, Jr. When Brown ran for governor, Sanders supported Louis Nunn. But Brown says he admired the colonel anyway, and even announced that a bust of Sanders would be placed in the state capitol. Yesterday, the governor talked with Action 11's Jeffrey Hutter about Harlan Sanders. I did a colonel is, uh, is a great man. And, of course, I had the privilege of working with him very closely for 10 years. And, you know, a man is usually never a prophet in his own hometown. If the people of this state really knew how brilliant this man was and what he meant to this state, uh, I think he'd be probably better recognized. Uh, he's one of the four or five what I consider really great people or outstanding people I've had the privilege to meet. The colonel was our founder and the colonel was our leader, and, uh, and I'll miss him. One of the first Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises was located at Kalen's Restaurant in Louisville. The Kalen's were longtime friends of the Colonel when he came to them in 1954 with his secret recipe for selling fried chicken. Action 11's Mark Pfeiffer is at the restaurant right now with our live action cam. Jim, Kalen's is no longer a Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise, but they still serve chicken. And they're preparing it here tonight the way the Colonel showed them back in 1954. The Kalin's son-in-law, Herb Rocky, was in the kitchen that day in 54 when Colonel Sanders, or Pappy as he was known to his friends, demonstrated his chicken frying. He came to us and to Mr. Kalin, who was a personal friend of his, and asked uh, if he would take his chicken and help and so forth and so on. Mr. Kalin agreed to this and uh, this is really how we got into it. It was a gentleman's agreement, strictly a handshake back in those days. Rocky also remembers traveling with the Colonel when he was on the road selling franchises. We were going up through Indiana one day, and uh, um, I didn't realize he was so adamant about this smoking bit. So he drove himself back in those days, and he had one of the first Cadillacs with all the automatic windows and all this stuff, and I light a cigarette. I'm sitting next to him. It's in February, it's probably about... 15 degrees outside, snow falling, the whole bit. Man, first thing you know, every window in that Cadillac came down. And I didn't know what was going on. And all of a sudden, he had that damn cigarette, you know? So I said, all right, I'll put it out. I never smoked another cigarette in that car with him again. Red hair, red face, and a red temper. That's how Margaret Kalin remembers Harlan Sanders when she and her husband, Bernie, first met the Colonel back in 1938. Oh, when I first met him, he was an awful nice person, but he did have a temper. Did he, Rowan? Oh. <laughs> You'll never know how much temper he had. Now, I don't want to say too much about the Colonel. He was a nice man, mm -hmm. and he certainly was nice to us. And he, Mr. Kale just thought he was the greatest person there was. He came to our golden wedding, and when Mr. Kale went down the church aisle, he saw him and he started crying. The Kalins say Harlan Sanders was a tough businessman who wasn't afraid to scold his partners if they made a mistake. But mostly, the Kalins remember the Colonel as a man who never forgot who his friends were. Mark Pfeiffer with the live action cam outside Kalins restaurant. To millions and millions of people in the Commonwealth and around the world, Colonel Harlan Sanders symbolized Kentucky. While just about everybody knows the business he founded, the Colonel means a lot of different things to different people. He made me and everyone here just a little special because we knew him, and that, that was very important to all of us. I feel that uh, Colonel Sanders stood for a number of things, primarily integrity as far as the business relationship with everybody he dealt with. In your mind, what did Colonel Sanders represent? I think he represented Kentucky to the world. He was like, um, like a governor of Kentucky. You could say ambassador of Kentucky. Like everywhere he went, they thought of him as being from Kentucky. In your mind, what did Colonel Sanders mean? Well, it meant that there's a chance for all of us maybe to get wealthy someday. <laughs> I mean, he made it in late in life.
And Colonel Sanders was very popular with charities because he worked hard for them. At his 90th birthday party, he gave a big check to the March of Dimes and shared the stage with the March of Dimes poster girl. Last year at this time, he was a bell ringer for the Salvation Army. No one could pass him without dropping something in the kettle. He would have been out this year if his health had allowed. The public can pay final respects to Colonel Sanders on Thursday. His body will lie in state at the Capitol Rotunda in Frankfurt from 10 to 5 with a memorial service at 1. Tomorrow, only family and close friends will visit at a Shelbyville funeral home. Kentucky Fried Chicken employees and franchisees will hold private services on Friday. The funeral will be Saturday at Southern Baptist Seminary, and that also will be private. So will the burial at Cave Hill Cemetery. The colonel's final resting place is already marked by his bust and a tombstone. Tonight at 7 o'clock, we'll have an Action 11 special report, the Kentucky Colonel, a look at the life and times of Harlan Sanders. If you think times are a little rough now, be glad you didn't sink all your money into a ski resort somewhere. There's not a lot of skiing being done, is there, Chuck? Not around here, especially. If you want to ski in southern Indiana, forget it. If you want to ski out in the Rockies, forget it. 70 degrees out in Denver this afternoon. But I'll tell you where you can go and find plenty of snow. That's up into New England because at Burlington, Vermont, they've picked up 10 inches of snow in the past 24 hours. In Boston, 3 inches of snow. In Concord, New Hampshire, five inches of snow and in portland maine also five inches of snow that's all because of a storm system a rather complicated area of low pressure along the east coast and you can see all the clouds from that low pressure and uh, that's where they're getting the snow so head for new england head toward the northeast if you want to do some skiing over the next few days or probably right through the uh, christmas holidays we have one low pressure system over North Carolina tonight, but the main low, the intense low pressure system right now is over Cape Cod, and that is bringing heavy snow to northern New England, and believe me, the ski areas up there are very, very happy. Well, out in the Rockies, they're not very happy because this afternoon in Denver, Colorado, the high temperature was 70 degrees, and it looks like that warmer weather is headed in our direction and is going to be here by Thursday. We're going to see temperatures probably up near 60 by Thursday. In the meantime, we have a big high pressure system uh, that is controlling our weather right now. That's north of the Great Lakes, and that will bring a clearing trend to our part of the country uh, later on tonight. We should see a good deal of the sun tomorrow, and then that milder weather by Thursday. Well, as we look at the action track color radar from the National Weather Service tonight, we don't see any snow out there or any rain. We have partly cloudy skies around the region. And as far as temperatures go, right now, 38 degrees here in Louisville. Our humidity is 70%. The wind is out of the north at 10 miles an hour. And the barometer stands right now at 29.91 inches and is holding steady. The high temperature for the day, 40. The low temperature early this morning, well, 34 degrees, 36 rather. No rainfall in the past 24 hours, and the monthly total is now at 0.91, pollution 57, and that's moderate. Partly cloudy really sums it up around the region tonight. It's 36 here in Louisville, 35 at London, Kentucky, and 40 degrees at Bowling Green. So for us, it's partly cloudy. No mention of snow in the forecast. It's going to be cold, an overnight low of 25 degrees. For tomorrow, the sun will be coming out. A high temperature tomorrow of about 42 degrees. And then on Thursday, that's when the warmer weather gets here. A high of 56 degrees. Mild on Friday. A little bit colder for the weekend with temperatures in the 40s to around 50. And once again, no snow in our local forecast. Even if they got out a snowmaking machine, it would just melt. That's right, absolutely. It. What are you going to do? Thank you, Chuck. Kentucky is number one in one basketball poll. Dave Conrad will have that and more sports coming up. And we'll talk about pro football. The Rams are in the playoffs, and the Dallas Cowboys are in shock. Highlights of last night's NFL Monday Night Football game and more coming up. This week, you get to choose your favorite poll. You can be right one way or another. If you're a Kentucky fan, you want to be right. number one. You can't lose. You just don't pay attention to the other one. That's all. <laughs> the weekly college basketball polls from AP and UPI differ again on who is number one. UPI lists Kentucky tops, and AP has DePaul number one. The Associated Press also ranks this man's team, Pancho Wright of the Louisville Cardinals, as the 20th team in the nation, despite the Cardinals' losing record of one and three. 
Let's check AP's top 20. DePaul, number one, according to the Associated Press, although by only 12 total votes over Kentucky out of nearly 1,200 cast. UK second, followed by UCLA, Oregon State, and Virginia. Sixth is Notre Dame, followed by Ohio State, North Carolina, Maryland, and LSU. Indiana heads the second group with pursuit coming from Wake Forest, Texas A&M, Arizona State, and Michigan. And completing the top 20, Iowa, Illinois, BYU, Arkansas, and Louisville. The Cardinals, of course, are back in the elite thanks to their first win of the season Saturday over fourth-ranked Maryland, as Action 11's Maria Mannion reports. Up until now, some people have been saying the Cardinals have been suffering an identity crisis. The reality of Daryl Griffith gone and three straight losses. But Saturday's win over Maryland may have given the Cardinals what they really needed, an identity and winning incentive. Well, but now, you know, we know that we got to go out there and play hard against everybody. If we'd have played as hard as we played against Maryland, against those other two guys, you know, it might have been a different turn, turnout in the game. So now I think everybody kind of realizes that we got, you know, to be good, you can't just be good on your talent alone. You got to work hard and practice and everything. Another young man who feels pretty good right now is Rodney McRae, who led the UofL team effort Saturday with 17 points and 13 rebounds. You know, it's the first time in my college career that I've done that, and, you know, it makes me feel even better knowing that we won the game and, you know, I played that well. There's a lot more confidence, I guess, on the team. Well, you know, it made us feel kind of good being that we beat the number four team in the country and we were 0-3, you know, and we just wanted to get our self-confidence back and play the way we know how to play. At the end of the Cardinals' 78-67 victory over Maryland, Poncho Wright took a pass from Marty Pulliam and executed a razzle-dazzle 360-degree slam dunk, which he felt was a necessity, psychologically. Why did you need to make that kind of razzle-dazzle? What did it do for you and the team? Well, for the, I think I heard Eric, all the guys on the bench hollering for me to do a 360. I kind of heard so some people in the crowd hollering for me to do it. And, you know, I had lost the ball about four or five times that game, so I thought, you know, if I did something spectacular or whatever, you know, it kind of make everybody forget about the four I lost. And it really made the crowd come alive, just like last year, didn't it? Yeah, they, they just, I guess they were kind of thinking about Daryl a little bit. The Cardinals will try to continue their renewed confidence Saturday as they go for win number two against Utah. Maria Mannion, Action 11. In college football, Rex Dockery has resigned as the head football coach at Texas Tech to become the new head football coach at Memphis State. Dockery's teams at Tech over his three seasons were 15, 15, and 2. In pro football, did you see that debacle between the L.A. Rams and Dallas Cowboys last night? Or were you one of the lucky ones who slept through it like the Cowboys did? Rams jumped on Dallas early and never let up. Colin Bryant capping a 98-yard drive with that four-yard touchdown run. And then rookie running back Jarrell Thomas, one of very few healthy backs the Rams have, rambled for 34 yards and another score. And if that wasn't enough, Vince Ferragamo hit Billy Waddy for another touchdown, 38-14. The Rams over the Cowboys, no contest. You watch that football game, I had a difficult time deciding whether I had more fun watching that game or rotating the tires on my car last Saturday. It was just I thought it would bummer. be close because Dallas doesn't want to be a wild card. They want to win that division, and now they have to whip Philadelphia By pretty... 26. 26 points in order to get the home team advantage. Not so likely. Could be something. Thank you, David. When Action 11 continues, Ned McGrath answers the North Pole mail call. Tis the season, all right. Letters to Santa Claus, care of the North Pole, are showing up again at Louisville's main post office. And that's where Ned McGrath went today on his appointed rounds on this Ned's third day of Christmas. Jack Moorhatch is going to work at the post office. Not for the post office, at the post office. Jack is not a postal worker. He's a college student who's helping the post office, and Santa Claus, of course, with all the extra mail this time of year. I find time for it. So, you know, every, everyone carries a little load, and then that lightens the big load. Now, Jack, here's one where I read uh, the words, I want, in this one 14 times. Yes. A real laundry list. Just, uh, some of the things that this kid wants. It's a china doll, an 18-inch tall candy doll, Donnie Marie's sing-along, a soap. Working as one of Santa's helpers, you see all kinds of letters. Dear Santa, please bring me a space gun. I promise to share it with my brother Randy. Dear Santa, we're leaving for Florida on the 19th. Could you please come this Friday with your presence? And P.S. Santa, thank you for making toys and making people happy. 
check. Not all of the letters are from children. Here's one from a from a, a mother with two children. And I wondered if you could read it from, from here on. All righty. A basket of food is all I need, so please, if you can, find it in your heart with a little help this year. May God bless you this year. You're going to help this woman, aren't you? Indeed, I am. Indeed. Jack Morehatch left the post office for his appointed rounds. He doesn't wear a red suit, but doesn't he remind you of someone? You kind of feel like Santa Claus? I look like him, don't I? It gives a person a warm feeling when you know you've done, when you've known you've made a fine accomplishment to help another person. And I think it's the best way to get into the Christmas spirit. And who says you can't get good help these days? I'm Ned McGrath, and that's life on the third day of Christmas. We'd like to remind you once again that at 7 o'clock tonight, we'll have an Action 11 special report on the life and accomplishments of Colonel Harlan Sanders. At 11 o'clock tonight, any late news developments, and Dave Conrad is going to report on a battle of the unbeatens. Ballard and Floyd Central have at it tonight. Dave will have the highlights, and Chuck will have the latest weather. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you at 7 and then 11. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening. The American consumer was hit by a double dose of bad news today. In Indonesia, OPEC announced crude oil price increases that could raise the cost of gasoline and home heating oil by as much as a nickel a gallon. And here at home, major banks jumped their prime lending rate a full percentage point to the highest in history. Members of the incoming Reagan administration said that interest rate news demands early dramatic action.